genocide of Srebrenica happened. Um, obviously, this news was coming out, and we were calling it genocide at the time, but clearly there was uh, an organised attempt to wipe out certain men of, of, of the boys of Srebrenica. Um, and it stopped us in our tracks here because we were two months from opening um, at Holocaust Memorial, the first Holocaust Memorial in the UK as a warning from history and then right in Europe there was something going on and we didn't know at the time, of course we didn't know, was it going to continue, was it going to you know, go get even larger, would it be in full swing when we opened here, how do we respond to that and frankly we didn't know, we didn't know what to say, we didn't know what to do uh, about that because trying to get into all the comparisons and then um, you know what do you, what are you supposed to do about it anyway uh, and and so I think the state of, of almost paralysis that we had um, has helped to shape something. And of course, this was on the back of the, one, of the genocide of the one happening a year earlier, which had also kind of you know frozen us. Um, but um, we decided then after genocide in Rwanda, we missed it completely. Didn't know how to respond. That that well, these things you know it's ha doesn't don't happen that often. We you know hugely embarrassed and ashamed that we missed what happened in Rwanda, didn't have any commentary to say about it um, um, at the time. Um, and then, you know, within a year, the Srebrenica. So um, what happened was we were going to put, put this Holocaust Centre on its pause. We decided to delay the opening. Steve and my brother got themselves a pass to go off to Bosnia. It didn't go in the end, because I, I uh, with the UN, was going to go out there. But in the end, we decided that we don't want to do anything out there. We can see on the TV screens, Martin Bell was out there on our TV screens every day. Um, um, what would we actually accomplish by, by, by doing that? And in the end, we felt that opening this place as a memorial um, is even, you know, it's even a stronger imperative to do that, post Rwanda, post um, Srebrenica, um, and everything else that happened in the region. Um, and um, but that we shouldn't stop at it being um, you know, a Holocaust memorial. That these events that had happened in the preceding year should shape somehow what we do and and, and so on um, here. Um, in the event once we opened, um, we were just under um, um, I, I guess a lot of pressure from schools to provide a service, and you know we didn't quite know what we were doing really. So we ended up just trying to provide some programs for schools because they, they were by that stage on the national curriculum um, and the buses were turning up here and we had to kind of deal with all of that so we put uh, you know Bosnia and Rwanda on hold a little bit um, but it, it did shape the the, uh, the the purpose of this place um, in, in that we knew it had to have some preventative role um, whatever or contribution whatever that is um, and um, it, I guess the next few years was something of a, a, a journey of inquiry for us, trying to understand more and go to seminars, conferences, trying to get a, a head around, uh, well, this happened in Europe, the Holocaust, what happens when you've got other crimes against humanity, genocide, is there a pattern there, is there some contribution we can make through education, awareness, campaigning, whatever. So it was after the Kosovo crisis in 1999, I was a medic, uh, a medic then, um, by then, graduated in 93 from Leeds and went over to um, Kosovo and so that's really what shaped Aegis is that there was all of that, we knew we should do something, then the Kosovo crisis happened and by that stage um, you know we've been a little bit more engaged with what was going on you know, outside of the sort of history of the Holocaust, still very um, superficial I think but more engaged than we otherwise might have been. Um, and what impressed me going to Kosovo was, and I think at that stage we just wanted to be close to where there was some sort of you know, atrocity happening and try to understand from the victim's perspective uh, on, on the ground. Um, and uh, I think what struck me first was that whatever happened in Kosovo in 1999 was fairly predictable. Something was going to happen um, uh, post the Dayton Agreement and so on. Um, and the diplomatic activity, political activity to prevent that was minimal and yet the resources that were thrown into Kosovo 
I mean, what I, which I observed when I was there, when I was in Albania actually across the border to start with, was just unbelievable. Um, and um, I, mean, I spoke to refugees that had their bags packed for um, several months before they were forced out of their homes. So they knew something was going to happen. And, um, and it was around about that time that we then, well, about six months later or so, um, that we, we, we formed Aegis. And what was that meant, what that was meant to do was to try to understand, um, uh, to see if it's possible to understand more about the context in which these massive atrocities occur, that if, it, if there is, if there are warning signs, um, um, is it possible to do something about that in terms of have some kind of intervention? Um, whether it's political, economic, education, through media, you know, we didn't know, we just wanted to bring people from different disciplines together to discuss those, those ideas, and, and, um, and that's what we did in, I guess the first major gathering was in, um, in 2001, or 2000, January 2002, I think, and um, which was funded by the Foreign Office, Foreign, Foreign Commonwealth Office, um, and so we just was going to have those various strands. Originally, it was meant to be all about um, research into, uh, and not, not just doing our own reinventing the wheel. There are, as you know, um, attempts at doing early warning out there and a certain sort of risk uh, assessment of high-risk areas. And the question is, in those high-risk areas, can you have some sort of intervention? The, um, the, the, um, what, um, happened next is that we got a little bit diverted by the project in Rwanda um, and still are on that diversion uh, but it's become something quite central to us because um, it was actually gov the government of Rwanda and survivors who came here um, um, requested that we work with them at the genocide memorials um, because there was some very forward thinking in the government particularly the mayor of Kigali who understood that whatever comes out of those memorials in the subsequent generations is going to impact on the country in an immense way. Um, and um, I think the, the contrast to what you'll be seeing in Bosnia, in the sense that leadership there utilises memory for its own purposes in creating identity, um, the sort of extreme nationalist identity and how that stirs up animosity and is forming in Bosnia the um, seeds, uh, the environment in which conflict will, I think, almost inevitably occur one day. If there is not, it, you know, it's happened for 700 years, there is very little, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's, there's certain NGOs and media people trying to do things out there, but generally the, the political sort of construct that's there and the, the drive by the, um, um, to, to reinforce um, the, you know, identity along those ethnic grounds and the identity being formed by what's happened in previous generations, including what happened in the 1990s, um, is, is just creating barriers in a little territory where there is going to be economic pressures, there's going to be... So I think that, that what we're trying to do in Rwanda, and we think the difference is we have the space to do it there because the government, I would say the government as a whole understands the complexity of identity because they've also got really serious issues with identity out there um, and how that's going to play out in the next generation and this an elite out there that, you know, is, is causing resentment and things so on. But at least as Kat's seen, we've got a space in which the history and the memory can give dignity to survivors, but at the same time, what Aegis's role is there is to create, uh, protect a bit of a, uh, I guess, create a bubble where Rwandan educators can bring young people from different backgrounds and start to have discussions, very difficult discussions about what happened, and steer away from the genocide reinforcing identity in a negative way, full of hatred and animosity and so on, and try to engage you with those issues on, on discussions around responsibility, um, um, which is where, I guess, in a way, social justice comes in and, and international law and how does all that feed in 
into a society and community having a transition um, into more of a stable, um, stable environment rather than one in which you've got um, you know, polarised communities. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in Rwanda they've had attempts through the Kachacha process and, and um, of course, it's the Arusha International um, Courts, uh, Tribunals, um, and, um, you know, the, the, the impact that that has is, is, is mixed. Um, uh, I think overall it was a, it was a good attempt um, at a, a localised justice given the scale of the problems. Um, and what we're trying to do with the interest is try to take whatever happened in Gacha, Gacha, the good and the bad, to try and least continue the debate so it's something that's discussed about, isn't just pushed under the carpet, or isn't just a government narrative that's thrown to people in, in, you know, in schools and, and so on, but try and create area, places where um, there can be security to talk about those things. Um, and it's not something that can be done in a two-year, three-year project. This is something that we envision to take 20, 30 years. If you don't have that 20, 30-year plan to, to constantly go at those issues and create critical thinking, and that's what a lot of this is about. We've looked at what does prevention really mean in the context of an intervention, an educational intervention. Um, and we've looked back at work by people like Erwin Stahl, um, who's a Canadian psychologist himself, a child a survivor actually of the Holocaust, um, and they've, looked, they, they've concluded that there are um, that, that the, some of the key um, um, key factors in people that rescue, for example, when everyone else is killing, why do you get these minority people that rescue? And why are people killing or standing by pretending they can't see what's going on? Um, and, and what it seems to boil down to is two things. One is about um, independent thought, critical thinking. They don't just simply follow what the rest of the community is saying, what the media is saying, what the government is saying. Um, and secondly, they seem to be driven by something that I guess we broadly call empathy, um, that they, when there's all the dehumanisation going on, they don't follow that, the ideological idea that these people are subhuman, these people are a threat. Um, they see them as ordinary human beings, their neighbours, their friends, family. And so what we're trying to do through the programme in Rwanda, it's a bit of a, an experiment, is see if there are, are, we can do uh, workshops, discussions, to actually somehow promote empathy and promote critical thinking, have discussions about individual responsibility and get debate going. In a society, I'm not sure how long you were there for, Kat, but, but a society where it's quite authoritarian, I don't know how much, I mean, it's difficult to know this, because you, when you first go it's there... Working, it's yeah, it's oh, you're working, you're working somewhere? Yeah, you, you guys weren't involved at that point, you were just starting to... Right, so, um, I mean, it's difficult to always understand, because you go to Rwanda and it's just incredibly inspiring, but things are still quite controlled in, in terms of, sort of, the narrative that goes on, the things that we're talking about here. Um, and actually, Kisimba is one of the stories that we're trying to use. Why is it that those three brothers, um, you know those three brothers, don't you? Yeah. Uh, why is it those three brothers, um, all with completely different personalities, um, have put their lives on the line to rescue these 400 people? And actually, if you spoke to Jean-Francois and Dumas, and, you know, they, they say, oh, why we did this? But actually, what it comes down to is the fact that they look at those people as Tootsies. Their parents said it had insisted to them, these people, these orphans that were brought at home are their brothers and their sisters. So actually they became, because of that idea that their parents gave them, they were just immune to all the propaganda that was going on. Um, so that's what we're trying to think. Is it possible? You know, it, it, was this about nature or nurture? Um, and if it was about nature, then there's much hope that it's going to be one or two percent of people that are like this. But I think from, from um, what we understand from the extinction of it, actually there's actually a lot of nurture that was going on there, that they were actually learning this. And so what we're trying to think see is, can you, instead of having 1% of the population that behave like this, could you increase that to, say, 10% of the population? Um, and is there a critical mass so that you can actually create this resilience within a community against violence? And that's why, um, you know, just coming back, um, uh, you know, I guess our learning ground on all this is Rwanda, but um, in Bosnia, I just think, you know, it's incredibly difficult. Everything is just set up because you haven't, at least over there, even though the government's touchy about things that people do, and we have to be very careful not to push the boundaries too hard, too far, the things that we can't talk about there. Um, you know, in Bosnia, it's, you know, the lines are so clearly 
drawn, um, I think it's very, very, very difficult. Richard, you know, wants he just to replicate the programs that we're doing in Orlando in Bosnia somehow, and it's not the only one. We, 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 you know, people have asked if we can get the Baltic programs out there, but you know, my answer to this, um, um, you know, to Richard and others, is that that, um, um, that until we can measure what we're doing in a place that is difficult but not easier than Rwanda and see that you know, the methodology is actually having an impact and it's being evaluated. We have no business going there because there's a chance you start to discuss these things you can cause more harm. And so, you know, that, that's, that's really where we've got to. And so that's, that's, I guess, in the thumbnail a little bit about how he just is involved in, and how we now, why we started in this um, area of, of, I guess, research campaign, early warning interventions. What we've learned, because I guess the Rwandans have insisted that we do this, it, and from our experience here, is that actually memory and education should be shaped in such a way that it has a preventative role. And, and we see that that's our, our growing niche. And we don't see something that's a quick fit to say, it's something that's going to be a very long-term programme that you know, we'll get external people we are doing to you know, psychologists and so on to keep looking at maybe um, you know, social anthropologists or whoever to look at what we're doing to see to try and get some sort of sense and, and evaluation of what we're doing. We did have an international law program you know, um, that unfortunately has wound down quite significantly this past year. It's still kind of there. We ostensibly have it as one of the tracks of Aegis, uh, a major funding for, for, for it. Um, we didn't get renewed by the European Union because it's complicated for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but it's such a shame uh, how much Richard has told about it. It was a really fantastic program building case files. The law that, that um, now allows a prosecution of suspects, genocide suspects in this country is, is an aegis, it was an aegis campaign and we drafted the law um, along with um, a barrister from um, the Doughty Street Chambers um, and uh, then lobbied Parliament, House of Lords and it was quite a, quite a two year campaign to, to do that um, and it's led to an arrest of somebody um, so um, somebody from the Shining Path guerrilla, somebody who wasn't even on our radar. Oh. <laughs> so we didn't even know, but it just shows that this is why structural change is important yeah. because you don't have to campaign on specific issues, you get the policy change and uh, law um, change and things follow through. Are you currently lobbying for the formation of like a unit who can track these people down? Or? Yes, um, we haven't fully decided on that. We've got a meeting on the 4th of July in Parliament with the Parliamentary Group for Genocide Prevention with another barrister, oddly enough actually also from Doughty Street Chambers who had nothing at all to do with the first law, it's just I think it's a big um, organisation. I'm just looking at, at what we're looking at there is a list of, uh, sorry can you have time for me? Yeah, so we're lobbying for, for well, we're not, oh, do we need to lower it? So we're, we're, we're um, so the parliamentary group, we've got a, a meeting, and this is a presentation about um, what is known about war criminals living in this country, and we're trying to dissect what's going on between UK Border Agency and Scotland Yard, and it's really difficult, because UK Border Agency, I just keep, you know, they're just very difficult to communicate with, mm. but we're going to MPs, to bring them into Parliament to, to give, basically to present, and what we're trying to do then is try to figure out right. what the process should be, one between UK border agency, because at the moment this is a bizarre thing, people use the fact that they've committed war crimes to get asylum here, because what they say is that, look, what I've done, if you send me back there, they're going to hang me up my ankles and slit my belly open. Mm -hmm. And so they said, the Home Office says, well, quite right, we can't send them back there. We'll be involved in these you know, summary execution of these mm -hmm. people. But then there's been no mechanism after these people have virtually confessed to war crimes because there hasn't been a law here, no, no means to follow up. Now we've got this new law, they should actually refer those on to somebody to follow up, but of course it's, there's no, there is a unit within Scotland Yard to, to investigate these kind of crimes, the same unit that investigates terrorism and all the rest of it, and it's like, oh, we're swamped, and after all these people are the to us, terror suspects are, so, you know, you understand where the priorities mm -hmm. lie, so what happens if we sort of by default become a safe haven? So what we're trying to do is work out, is there a way to get a unit? Um, now, 
given this current economic climate, setting up a new unit probably is not going to be welcomed by anybody, um, particularly when there's a current risk, which comes back to justice again. What's the cost of justice? You know, if they're not a risk to work, do we, do we care enough about it in this country? Um, so what we're trying to do is to see if there's ways in which we can get certain people trained within the UK border agency. So at least they have officers who are trained to decide what to do about a case when something's flagged up, someone's a face virtually confessing to committed crimes. At the moment, solicitors and immigration lawyers know that's the way to get asylum here. So we're trying to, and that's obviously what they're advising people. So we're trying to close that down so that, that fine, you confess to this, you, get a, you might get temporary asylum, but then um, we just want to find a way in which they can actually be followed up and either deported or prosecuted or something like that. But it's just become very, very complicated. Mm. Um, could it be because you have something to add? Mm. Yes. Uh, to I'm wrap just up. Let me text out so we went. Okay. okay. <laughs> I could. Mm. I mean, like, it, it, you, you went to Europe, Bosnia, and Austria, those were presumably two weeks. Was it two weeks or a week? Five days. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, would you be able to tell them what kind of things you think they should be looking for and what things they should be Well, when you went out, um, we were just, I was just uh, making that link between the fact that um, in, in Rwanda there, there is, um, has been a, a, um, a, I think, an, an ability for uh, not just us but others to work in this area of looking at identity and education and transformation. But mm. I think it, you know, you'll see, and you know, Richard devised a fantastic program about. Um, where you, you can see very clearly where these lines are and go to Srebrenica and just try to get an idea of what the narrative is there, what kind of education programs are going on. And this isn't so, in Srebrenica you need to have places like this, and it's very important that survivors have places of dignity but, um, and, and, and remembrance, but if at the same time there is this animosity being stirred up, it's only, you know, you don't, it's not rocket science that this is going to cause problems. Um, if you look at, you know, go to schools and, and, and look, you know, see how actually schools are divided up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have Serbian kids on one level, Croatian kids on another level, learning different histories. Um, Competing histories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, you know, some of the sites, um, so it's gone out of my yes, head. Which is, you're son of us, thank you. So, 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 I mean, this, this is a hugely important place. You've been at the beginning of the trip. Right, at the very end of the same. The yeah. same, okay. Yeah. So, um, in some respects, I think it helps to form a, you know, the history of the place. Um, and, there's, you know, Mitch has got to get lots of details. You know, it's, it's incredibly helpful in understanding the, some of the context of, of what happened in 1990, the 1990s how you know, it, it interplays what happened during the Second World War, um, when you know, the Serb, Serbs were victims of Croatian um, nationalism, and how that all sort of ties up again with, in that whole area of um, the interaction between you know, Germany and Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and you've got this, you know, all these... Um, um, uh, um, is that okay? Okay. Mm. <laughs> well, okay, so we should go in a minute then. But, yeah. but, but I, think, I think just to, to say that, that that's, um, you know, that the history of there is hugely important. Uh, from my perspective in the Holocaust sense, of course, there is, an, there, is a, there is a connection with the Holocaust because it was one of the death camps and that's where Jews were taken and killed in that, uh, murdered in that region. Um, and it's interesting in a way that that camp doesn't feature on sort of the you know radar of general sort of yeah. known concentration camps and extermination camps. And I don't know why that is. It was a terribly brutal place. Um, um, uh, Jews were taken there, Jews were taken there, Serbs in the large number. Of course, the numbers are completely disputed between you on the Croat and Serb side. It's a huge, uh, and this is all part of the issue of debates and the competing histories and things that go on there. But the, there is, and, and that in itself, the competing histories is 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 so you know clear um, um, in uh, in that particular area. Um, but the, um, I, I think you know. Going, looking down at the layers about, you know, even going back, I think, you know, holding up Bosnia as well, I think it can even help to set the context of, you know, how did even, you know, the Nazis get into power in the first place, you know, this terrible mm. 